Five Nights at Freddy's is one of the biggest gaming franchises of the modern day, which is really surprising since it was made by literally one guy. One phone guy. Hello? Hello? Working at night. One thing gamers love to do with FNAF, other than sexualize some of the characters, is hate on it. And yeah, some decisions weren't great, but there's one aspect specifically that I think is better than a lot of you give it credit for. I'm talking about FNAF World. Come on, it's honestly pretty good. Okay, yeah, the lore. It's the most infamous part of the series, and for good reason. It's been built and added onto across every game in the series, and it's actually really intriguing to both returning fans and newcomers. Theorists have spent hours trying to break down what everything means. Like why Funtime Chica was so sexy. Don't get distracted! While I'm not here to answer all the questions, I am here to talk about the lore, more specifically, the hate it receives, because I think most of it is unfounded. So, what's first? Okay, everything's- I'm gonna I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> Okay, my heart cannot take this game. I need help. Hey baby girl, what's up? Uh, hey, you wanna talk about FNAF with me? Oh hell yeah, I'd uh, love to do that. You know, I've been playing Finds of Freddy's for so long, I'm practically a pro at it. Finds of Freddy's 3, Finds of Freddy's 4, You know, four, I played through OP. Junior's, Finds of Freddy's 1. Wanted one. Oh, Honestly, of I'm a pro. Trust me when I say, I'll be on this video, and I'll get you through it, wacko, okay? Huh. You know, I really thought something would happen when I said that, you know? <laughs> Hello? Spiffy? Most people enjoy the story of FNAF 1, even those that hate what the future games did. The game kept it simple, dark, and interesting. You get the sense that things aren't what they seem while playing the game. Due to the animatronic moans, the contradictions and untrustworthiness of Phone Guy, and of course, THE FACT THEY WANNA KILL YOU! Well, simple, the story is much more than just animatronic mascots willing to stuff you down a Freddy suit. By using old newspapers, along with deductive reasoning, you figure out that children were murdered at the pizzeria and stuffed into the animatronic suits. Oh, there's also a hidden fifth animatronic, who will crash your game if you encounter it. Other details that add story to the world is the Bite of 87. Uh, they used to be allowed to walk around during the day, too, but then there was the Bite of 87. And Phone Guy's apparent death. Oh no. Which gives death to the world aside from your job as the night guard. Lore was added to make the game more intriguing and to give you something to think about, but it also added something for players who really wanted to to go searching for something. It works really well and it honestly gets better from here. I hope. Oh! I'm gonna be honest, but like, I don't even use the flashlight. And what? Except for Foxy. And Not even for the vents? Nope. <laughs> After the success of the first game, Mr. Scott Coffin jumped right into the next one, but of course, needed more lore. A lot of people may assume that this is where Scott just sat down and, like, made the whole timeline, but no. The way he actually made it is fairly smart. In the next few games, lore was added to explain what happened before and after the previous game's story. FNAF 2, being a prequel, can tell us more about the past of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. This place being different from FNAF 1, and the fact that we know it's a grand reopening, tells us that there's in fact three different times Freddy Fazbear's Pizza has opened and then been shut down. Also, by using the dates on the paycheck at the end of the game, we can- Wait, what am I doing? <clears throat> Sorry, went uh, theorist mode there for a second. FNAF 2 tells us more about the robots, the killer, the brand itself, but without stepping on what was already established. This game is set during 1987, a year mentioned in the first game. Remember the whole Bite of 87 thing? Well, this is the year that happened, obviously, which means we now have a suspect for uh, who chomped down on a poor dude's frontal lobe. 
There's also the addition of more robots, more dead kids, and even mini games that elaborated on FNAF 1 and introduced us to the purple guy. Heck, this game is actually a prequel, but the story makes it seem like a sequel. This just shows that Scott was intent on letting us figure out every part of the game by ourselves. But even with being confusing, if you go through the game assuming it's a sequel, it can still be enjoyed. This game adds a lot, and we could dive into all of it. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the game built off the previous in both lore and gameplay while still being digestible by the average player and lore hunter alike. You know how Phone Guy mentions that the previous place had doors? Uh, something else worth mentioning is kind of the quirky modern design of the building. You may have noticed there are no doors for you to close. <laughs> yeah, the place that we know that had doors was opened after this one? Maybe FNAF 1's pizzeria was opened after and before FNAF 2's. And eh? Or maybe neither open because this is all a fictional horror game and who cares? Anyway, I just love trying to figure this stuff out, but as I said earlier, the game still works even if you don't know any of it. You can still learn the story of FNAF 2, that being of the puppet, the toy animatronics, the murderer, etc. You don't need to know whether this is a prequel or a sequel to learn that, and therefore the story still holds up. I don't want to get demonetized. Hey. I'm thinking of a. Aww. Oh. <laughs> 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 FNAF 3 goes in the other direction. I hate this one, but uh, that's just because I'm bad at it. Anyways, instead of seeing the company's past, we see the end of the story and the death of the killer. Who's gonna tell him? What? Anyways, Final Fantasy 3 takes place in the future at a horror experience similar to a haunted mansion. Springtrap was locked in the sealed safe room in Final Fantasy Freddy's 1. Later he was found and brought to the horror attraction. But uh, who is Springtrap? Well, he is the killer of the children at Freddy's. And he's also an animatronic. Okay, we need to explain a couple things first that happened even further in the past. Notably, Springlock suits. Springlock suits are animatronic suits that double as both animatronic and suit. While in suit mode, the spring locks are pulled back to allow someone to be inside the suit. Of course, in animatronic mode, these spring locks snap back in place to form the endoskeleton. The killer was inside one of these spring locks, and uh, the spring locks snapped back into place with him in the suit. Oh yeah, um, I guess I should mention there was also some ghost kids who took part in the spring locks activating, but well, because because ghosts speak. Uh, moving on. The Springlock suits are honestly really cool and creepy, and I love how they seamlessly fit new lore with previously established material, like for example, Golden Freddy, and how he wasn't able to move in the first game is explained by him just being a different kind of suit. This game had far less to discuss than FNAF 2, but it was still set up really well and doesn't detract from simply playing the game normally. So as you can see, the main FNAF lore is fairly straightforward, fun to figure out, and doesn't detract from the gameplay. Spiff, are you calling me? I'm a PNG talking to you through the magic of YouTube. Why would I call you? Hello? Wacko? This is your doctor. The test results didn't come back as healthy as I'd like them to. I regret to inform you that you have a severe heart problem and should really seek to prevent anything horror related from happening in long stretches of time. This is a medical emergency. Wrong number. Damn, that sucks, little bro. I tried to warn you, I heard it. After the first three games and a decent development of lore, Scott decided to just go off the rails. But it's honestly not that bad. FNAF 4 was supposed to be the last game in the series. Okay, well, all of them were, but FNAF 4 especially. And it was supposed to tie up the story, which is weird since FNAF 3 already did that. Unless FNAF 3 tied up the wrong story. 
Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is all about a young child who has an annoying older brother, a potentially murderous father, and a fear of Freddy Fazbear's pizza. Not of Freddy Fazbear specifically, but of the pizzeria itself and the secrets that lie within it. This lore seems completely different from everything we've seen before, and we're shown a bite, which you may assume is THE BITE OF 87?! When in reality it's the bite of 83. This game follows the young child having nightmarish animatronics hunt them down in their own house. And of course, He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who you gonna call? Psychic friend, Fred Bear. <laughs> um, this game ends with the crying child's unfortunate death and a promise to be put back together. There's a lot more in this game, but it's so confusing to figure out and people constantly argue whether this game is before FNAF 2 or if the events of the first three games were just a dream made by the young child that you play as. There's plushies, a broken foxy plush, toy characters including a chica whose beak falled off, the older brother jumps out behind objects wearing a foxy mask, there's shadowy people putting others in a suit, so many bizarre features of the previous game can be explained by things this child sees every day. I honestly don't think it matters, since the game taking place in a kid's dream doesn't mean the story behind it was all fake, it simply means the gameplay itself of robots trying to kill you isn't actually happening. Similar to how Ultimate Custom Night may have lore sprinkled in, but the actual gameplay of you manually setting the animatronic difficulty isn't actually happening. So I don't think this dream theory actually ruins the lore like a lot of people thought it did. Fans also didn't like that the game had a completely different bite, but personally, I like it. It's pretty obvious that this isn't the bite of 87 since the game takes place in 1983, so this feels like just a slight misdirection, adding complexity but not making it impossible to solve. However, people were irritated with the lore since it felt like it kept changing and decisions made at one point were decided to be important only after they were made. Like how in Finance of Freddy's 1, Foxy is out of order, which was likely done to explain why the curtain is closed, but later could have been a clue towards dream theory, since the plushy Foxy was the only one broken. This was made for gameplay reasons, but now could be a crucial clue, but if dream theory isn't true or was retconned, then these coincidences just make things more confusing. However, I'd like to ask, why is that a bad thing? In Star Wars, Mace Windu uses a purple lightsaber, not for lore reasons, but because it's cool, only afterwards did they go back and try to figure out the lore behind it. This isn't a backwards line of thinking only found in FNAF, this is just how a lot of lore is developed. You could say that this means in FNAF you have to question everything, like why did Freddy enter the girl's bathroom, and uh, yeah it's kind of the point. Anything potentially being a clue and trying to see what pieces you could fit together to solve one pointless detail that doesn't really matter is just the fun of theory hunting. I could write a 10 page paper on Mangle's gender if I wanted, because I still find this stuff fun. Yes, it's important to have some kind of story outline in your head, but it's also fun to just come up with cool ideas and try to fit them in however you can, so I don't think what he did was honestly that bad. Scott then decided to jump like 7 more sharks. Oh, you have to- ah! That was a scream of anger, not of fear. I want you to know that. If FNAF 4 was lore that people didn't grab onto, this location is lore people completely threw out the window. However, none of it is really that meaningless, and decisions that Scott made all made sense up until this point. He wasn't throwing the lore bits in all willy-nilly, he was setting things up to work with established lore, and the only thing that needed editing was an edit that the fans demanded be changed. He made one with a basic story, two that developed the characters and brand, three that finished off the character story, four that finished off the gameplay story, and world which is good but not important right now. I don't think your house like that you complimented FNAF world. Just talk about this location while I fix this. Scott had finished the lore up to this point, but people were too attached to it. They didn't want it to end that way, so Scott pushed it forward for us. Character names were dropped. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. 
animatronics were explaining their backstories. Did you know that I was on stage once? And the animatronics got futuristic and complex, d despite being before Five Minutes at Freddy's 1. FNAF was originally supposed to be a one-off project, but since it ballooned into, well, pretty much his only project, it would make more sense to fuse what worked with his passion. Scott combined FNAF with RPGs, novels, short stories, and in this game, with sci-fi, an art style that Scott really liked working in. Essentially, the reason I bring this all up is to say that maybe the sci-fi element didn't really work too much in the lore end, but it makes all the difference on Scott's end, adding his passion back in FNAF, and I gotta respect his decision there. With that said, Scott still had to find a way to progress a story that's lore had pretty much come to a close, and the way he did that was to build out more characters and explore their stories. My heart can't take this anymore. Purple Guy, now named William Apton, had a family, and their stories could be told in this new game, which meant nothing established about William would need to be tampered with. However, this does mean the timeline is a bit broken. The game would seem to take place near the end of the timeline since it's futuristic, but Davy is built by William, who stood on the wall, so maybe it's right before he was stood, but also the sister death can start the nightmare stomach house. But that one would not put at the start of the timeline, meaning that Freddy predates this Freddy, which was wrong because the fun times were made to capture the kids. Okay, that, that is too much. Changed. Theory. Um, so while it technically does fit and doesn't exactly contradict anything, it still feels very forced because it is. Again, this wasn't supposed to happen this way, but it was Scott's best solution to please both himself and the fans, and it seemed to have worked. FNAF fans loved taking apart this location. They were just hung up on a lot of the details, like the futuristic robots. However, overall, it still works and is understandable. I do think, however, that Scott learned his lesson, and in the next game, tried to fix a lot of things that this game may have broken. Spiffy, we're moving on! Why there's so much movement? <laughs> I'm genuinely terrified. Honestly, Wendy's is pretty good. Stop talking about chicken! <laughs> oh god, where are we? Oh right. Oh jeez. Sister Location was a standout game and plays very differently to the rest of the series. However, Pizza Simulator takes Sister Location's ideas and puts it back into the night-by-night -night structure of the previous titles. It also pulls the FNAF 3 and sets its story at the end of the timeline, attempting to not run into the issues Sister Location's story did. We have all the characters taken from wherever they are previously and put into this final building and then burned to the ground. The base story of this game is again easy to follow and satisfying to anyone playing it. Not to mention that while the game the game has a lot of endings, all of the endings are fun or silly, so no, no matter how you want to play the game, it's enjoyable. Again, the base story elements it adds are fairly clear. The main confusion comes from a lot of the smaller details, the things theorists love to pick apart. Who is Fruity Maze Girl? Who is Yellow Guy? And what could Candy Cadet be referring to? However, these aren't that important to the overall story. Except maybe can you get that one? But still, mostly not that important. Yellow guy could be purple guy, recolored to differentiate him from the other purple guy, or maybe it's just a completely different character we haven't seen before. Both can work, and the fact both work is fascinating. There's also Molten Freddy, who was apparently all of the cis location animatronics that made up entered, besides Baby, because she was kicked out of the animatronic fusion. Yes, that's complicated, yes, that's weird, yes, that's confusing, and it's difficult to explain, but there's just enough there that it can be explained, and it's awesome because of it. That's just what I love about the lore in this series. The story is well put together that it's interesting to learn about, but the smaller details are small enough that you don't need to know them, but interesting enough that finding them out is fun, and I personally love to figure things out. Dang it. This is really the last game in the franchise I even needed to discuss in this video, since everything after starts to tell a new story. Special Delivery and Help Wanted build lore about a game oh, studio. Oh, uh, Help Wanted? Help Wanted is the best game in the series. The lore is basically Dream Theory, if it was good. The past okay, games okay, are all okay. treated to be okay. entertainment to make light of what actually happened. I'll let him go off this time. As I was saying, these games are building up new characters for the next story in the franchise. Security Breach is that story put into action. It's set after everything else, so it doesn't really mess with what- Uh... Ready. Okay, FINE!
is more going on here than you realize. Security Breach is where I think the lore actually fell off the deep end, but I just can't bring myself to hate on it. It just feels wrong. Blue hey, trap, Spiffy. Mirror world, Spiffy. hard mode, enter... End communication. Huh? W what? Okay, you have free reign. Just talk about Security Breach. Oh, um... Okay, so let me be honest with you guys. Wacko initially, I was gonna have a small part in this video, and then Wacko said I get a bigger part in the video, and so he just gave me like part of his script, so I get to talk about Security Breach. But I kind of just deleted everything Wacko said because my thoughts on Security Breach, I, I, I have very strong feelings for. So let me get into this. Oh wait, Wacko didn't cut me off? All right. Um. Security Breach was an okay game. I guess I'll start off with saying some good things about it. It's had its issues and bugs, but you could play through the game and enjoy it. The graphics were fine, Freddy being a garden was interesting, and it being one long night instead of six was a very interesting concept. Plus, the giant mall and rockstar idea was super cool. Um, there was the mystery with what happened to Bonnie. There is no rabbit at the Mega Pizza Plex. Not anymore. Which, like, okay, that specifically was intriguing for the longest time. Because where is Bonnie? We heard a little bit about him from Freddy, but we never saw him until Ruin. And there was also the old pizzeria sim under Roxy Raceway, which when I first saw that, I was blown away. Just, Security Breach had a lot of cool un ideas. Unfortunately, that's some of the best I can say about it. Security Breach has a couple of endings, like Pizzeria Sim did, or Sif's location had the same thing. But it's the ending of Springtrap that I'm going to talk about. Or is it Burn Trap or Scra- it doesn't matter, it's Spring Trap. Now, this ending in particular made me nearly give up on Five Nights at Freddy's, at least from like a story standpoint. Spring Trap came back to life. Context clues tell us that this is actually Glitch Trap, but maybe in Spring Trap's Bondi? Okay, in Pizzeria Sim, Spring Trap was missing an arm, but in this game he has both arms, but he has some parts that might be from the Rockstar animatronics but we're pretty sure it's glitch trap because of Vanny. I have a few problems with the execution of this. For one, the boss fight, it's pathetic. The rock stars chase you down and you just have to close the doors or hide in Freddy. I mean, avoid the blob creature and then just press the buttons to blowtorch spring trap. That's it? This fight was super underwhelming. Hell, some people were able to burn glitch trap before the blob even spawned in. Overall, a very underwhelming fight. Let me remind you guys that Glitchup was built up and Help Wanted to be a force of nature. He converted Vanessa into Vanny, and one of the endings he gets out of the game. There is even the whole Princess Quest minigames in Security Breach, in Ruin, in, I believe, maybe Help Wanted 2, and even before that, in the Help Wanted mobile release. All of this was glitch trap like he was built up so much and he got a pathetic boss fight and then got taken out by the blob was that it this reminds me of current marvel writing or how suicide squad vs the justice league was where characters of importance are handled without any respect i could understand making lore confusing on purpose to build mystery and then like running into some issues of people not being able to figure it out but what was the point of building up glitch trap so much just to give him a sloppy fight. Okay, like, yes. Finance at Freddy is not a, a fighting game. Boss, like, it's not known for boss fights. But I feel like there could have been any m more decorum, more challenge, less of a pushover for, a like, your big bad that you've been building up to. Like, what lore reason is there for Glitch Trap being a pushover here? I know there was a rush in the production of this game, but I feel like the game would have been better if the Springtrap ending simply wasn't in the game and Glitchtrap was saved for a mystery later. Just, you know what, Wacko, take it from here. Even with all the issues, Security Breach was destined to fail. Being a big open 3D game means there's a lot of stuff that you could miss. In FNAF 1, when the posters change, you knew it, since there was very little you could see. But here, when there's masks that are missing from displays, you wouldn't be blamed for missing it, since there's so much to see, you just didn't see this one small detail. That's one reason that I love the lore in these games. The information was easy to find, you just had to piece it together. A lot of this game's lore felt like it had hints to other lore that it couldn't possibly be connected with. It felt less like being added to the end or beginning or next to the story, but instead trying to shove itself down the dead center with a lot of references to things we already knew, 
but he was just hinting at them, so it wasn't, like, real connections, so he just feels like it's nothing. There's just enough there, so fans go, Oh, 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 that's, that's the thing I know. It doesn't feel genuine, but I don't even know how much of this was supposed to be this way. Help Wanted and Special Delivery both hinted at employees essentially getting brainwashed by Springtrap, which could have been a really cool way to bring him back, yet keep him dead. But Security Breach just brings him back. This isn't confusing lore, or a red herring, or adding lore to random details that shouldn't have been important. This is ruining the previous game's perfect ending for the sake of shock value. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. So while FNAF could argue Definitely. Okay, so while FNAF may have broken the lore by now, the classic Scott era of FNAF was honestly better written than a lot of people get it credit for. Scott can definitely write a good story. I mean, the Fazbear Frights books are honestly really good. We didn't talk about them here, but I've been reading through them and are greatly enjoying them. But Fazbear Frights barely made any sense and don't even get me started on the Silver Eyes. Spiffy! The video is ending! Oh. Actually, there is one game after Security Breach that I haven't played, that being Help Wanted 2. I don't know much about it, so I should probably check it out. Um, wait, are you sure? Yeah, I definitely got this. Um, so, uh, t t tell me about the FNAF lore. Do you think it makes sense? Do you think it ever made sense? If so, when did it go crazy? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Alright, so, um, Wacko told me to just kind of, like, spitball the ending here, um, for, like, 20 seconds. So, I would like to, um, thank all of you for watching. I know Wacko put a lot of effort into this. And right now, as I'm recording this, I'm actually super excited to watch it. If you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe. I mean, as, as you can see, a lot of love and care is put into these videos. I see it myself with how Wacka works on it behind the scenes. And I think my time is running out, so um, like and subscribe. I'll see you guys next time. Uh, Wacka will see you guys next time. Future at a furry costume. I'm going up it. I'm so sorry, Wacko. If I have to re-record this part, tell me. I got this. Out of order.